Tonight, Video West looks at the ultimate drug, television, as we view the technology and the talent that keeps a society turned on. We'll talk with Norman Lear, Harlan Ellison, and the Smothers Brothers about the creative process and meet some people whose lives have been forever changed by their relationship with the small screen. We'll also look at the brave new world of video technology and see what lies ahead and inside our TV screens. So sit back and keep turned on to the ultimate drug tonight on Video West. Television is so obsessed with keeping up with the present that it's easy to forget that it has a past, too. not forgotten TV's glorious past is Jerry Grolke, perhaps the owner of the world's finest antique television collection. Jerry remembers when TV was more than just funny black and white pictures. It was a way of life. A lot of these sets that I have, people have said that they were when they first got them, that the neighbors gathered around and it was a big family affair and uh, really kind of brought people together. With today's televisions, everything looks pretty much the same. When you take a 19-inch TV table model, they all look the same. In 1948-49, everybody had their own idea. Like here, a totally round screen. Here, a screen that's rounded on the edges. Uh, here, one that's rectangular mast. Uh, different types of systems to tune them in. Everybody had their own idea. Everybody thought my system is going to be the one that's success accepted. And so after about 1950, they started becoming more and more standardized. The larger the screen you had, the more status you got. So therefore, people would buy magnifiers to make their picture bigger to impress people and have a, as large a picture as possible. This is a very popular set, too. It's a really attractive set. It's kind of Art Deco looking. and. Uh, very much uh, in style at the time, and it was very inexpensive. A lot of people that, if they could afford a television, this would be the one they would buy, because it was $159.95. Television has controlled people's lives for the past 30 years tremendously, more than any other medium, more than radio ever did, more than when phonograph was invented, more than when newspaper or any other uh, invention ever. Television has developed this more than anything. And these particular sets that I have were the very first that came into people's lives, the first inkling of what it would be like. Looking back, it seems that Philo T. Farnsworth was born to invent television. At the tender age of 14, he envisioned what other established scientists could not, the ability of scanning electrons to encode and transmit an image. One year later, he astounded his high school chemistry teacher with this diagram describing the theory. Driving headlong toward his rendezvous with history, Farnsworth set out to make his vision a reality. Working in this San Francisco building, he reached his goal in September 1927. Using this tube, his so-called image dissector, he succeeded in creating the very first television picture. Farnsworth's wife, Elma, and son, Philo, remember him proudly. The next year, uh, which was se September 1st, 1928, he had a press conference and brought the press in. And then he it was written up all over the country. It really took the public and the press's eye because here, a young man of 21, as he was then, um, had done something that the big corporations hadn't been able to, even with all their money. He accomplished this thing. He started trying in 26, and he got it in 27 at a cost of $25,000. I mean, it was really a, a heroic effort. This was indeed the first place that TV ever happened. 
And did the man who invented television know what he was getting us into? It seems remarkably that he did. He was a very foresighted person. He thought things through very carefully, and he uh, he told me when uh, before we were even married that he was going to change the world. How many hours a day do you watch TV? About one. One? Why? Because it's not much, much, huh, much. Okay. It's not much to look at, huh? Yeah. How many hours a day would you say you watch TV? Twelve. You watch TV 12 hours a day? Oh, I like TV. Weekdays, about three. It's like yesterday, Sunday, 12, 14. 12, 14 hours on a week weekend day? Yes, that's what I did. Yesterday was 14. Really? How many hours a day would you say you watch TV? About five, six, mm -hmm. you know, almost the whole night, really. Yeah, you, know? you like it a lot? Yeah, there's nothing else to do, just watch TV. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> what would you do if you didn't have TV? 12 hours a day you watch TV and you sleep about eight hours a day, that doesn't leave much time to do anything else. Yeah, my mother said I'm a TV addict. Yeah? You are a TV addict, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever tried withdrawal? Hmm. Yeah. You know what you are? You're a screeny. You've been brainwashed by the Reverend TV screen. Yeah, I believe so. Without the writer, most of what we watch on television would be no more exciting than animated test patterns. Few writers have written for and about television with more success than Harlan Ellison. Ellison enjoys an adversary relationship with the medium and has typically strong views on the role of television in society. Uh, there are people who would... Uh sit and watch them drag books out of libraries and burn them in piles in the streets. They would stand and watch uh, old ladies mugged to death by street gangs and they would not lift a finger. But if you were to take their TV away from them, they would be on the steps of City Hall with pitchforks and pump shotguns in five minutes. That is because nobody likes their dope taken away from them. And that's what TV is, it's dope. It's the most addictive kind of dope we have ever produced on this planet. It's more addictive than uh, hallelujah religion. It is more uh, addictive than heroin. It is more addictive than even booze. And uh, it is easily available. It's there 24 hours a day, and it's readily accessible to any mentality because there is no mentality too low to appreciate something on TV. I mean, once you have seen The Gong Show and Family Feud, you know that there is nothing lower. <clears throat> Uh, it's a lazy nation. We're, we're a nation that has gotten away from reading difficult books, uh, from eating good food, uh, from doing dangerous things. Uh, we are easily gulled by yellow ribbons and Ronald Reagan. We are easily gulled by fast food, McDonald's toad burgers, and uh, creative typists like uh, Judith Krantz and Sidney Sheldon and Harold Robbins. This is not, this is trivial. And as, uh, as John Gardner has said, it is only the presence of the serious and the uplifting which makes the world safe for trivia. But there is nothing but trivia from end to end on television, and it is the people who do nothing about it. They watch it. They watch it night and day. And it would not matter if you were programming Shakespeare 24 hours a day. They would then sit there and watch Shakespeare 24 hours a day with their Pringles and their beer and getting zits all over their bodies and their brains turning to puree of bat guano. That is what television is all about. It requires absolutely nothing. It requires only that you sit there and get washed. It, 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 it reduces you to the alpha state and you can be very easily gulled. You can be conned into anything. So many shows to choose from, aren't there? There just aren't enough hours in the day to do all the viewing you want, still accomplish all the other things you want in life. Do you sometimes wish there were a way of watching TV and films faster? Well, now there is. At the Val Normal Viewing Dynamics Institute, we've developed special speed watching techniques to enable you to watch video and films 10 to 12 times faster than you do now. Imagine an entire evening's viewing in just 15 minutes. This speed watching course is fabulous. It gives me all sorts of free time to wash the dishes. In just one afternoon, I can catch up on three weeks of my favorite daytime operas and remember every detail. I was one of those guys who'd come home from work and watch TV all night. Then my wife gave me the Val Normal course for our anniversary. Now I find I have a lot more time to sleep. Val Normal invites you to a special introductory session in your area. You'll see Gone with the Wind and Roots in their entirety in just one 30-minute session. We're confident this introduction will convince you to enroll in this remarkable course. Here's where to enroll in your area. That's Val Normal Viewing Dynamics Institute, Suite 11, Hot Spot Motel, Friday and Saturday 9 p.m. Call 415-957-5770.
How do you think television's affected uh, our society? Made me a little lazier. Uh -huh. uh, makes everybody lazier. Puts everybody in a place where they don't have to make no effort. There's a lot of crazy people here. Uh -huh. You know that? And it's all because of television. Our, our kids are a little rent because of television. Yeah. You really think so? Yeah, I know so. You have kids? No. Really turn these the kids around. As far as uh, they seem to just be vidi idiots, I guess. Uh-huh. As uh, Jersey uh, Kaczynski would say. Uh-huh. Another writer who has given television serious thought is Jerzy Kozinski, the author of Being There, perhaps the ultimate fable of the passive TV generation. Kozinski sees Chauncey Gardner as more than a literary character. He is a warning. The idea for Being There was triggered by the public opinion poll released in the mid-60s by, by McCloskey here in California, in which 86% of those who voted for him admitted they did not know his views and voted for him only on the strength of his appearing honest on television. What I like about being there was that Sellers managed to convey the medical dimension of someone brought up on television. Mm -hmm. Passive, verbally restricted, non-driven. We need visual element in America, and not only in America, in the Western world, somehow to reassure us that things are not profound. We don't want things that are profound because you cannot detect anything profound from the, from the visual image. You cannot. What I'm basically saying is that the image is by its nature presentational. It's not consequential. It's non-logical. People watching our program right now don't know when it took place. It's not important. They watch it now. They see only what they see. There is no past and there is no future to it. This is what I think what the Western world is finally I think, deserving to have. It deserves a flat surface presentation of reality. And that's what we are getting. I'll be right there. Jeopardy! You want to play? Come on, let's sure. go. Right. Let's go, let's go. Jeopardy! All right. Want to play? Yeah. yeah. Oh All let's right. Go. Let's go. Players, are we ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay, then what do you say? Let's play Jeopardy! Yeah. So remember, players, in this game, there is one daily double hidden somewhere on that board. How many? One. Where? On that board. What? A daily double. Right. Okay, who won the toss of the card? Ray, you won the toss of the card backstage. Oh. You got the right to select the first category mount. Good luck. And go. Dun, 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 dun. TV Bob Bodine is a devotee of that most peculiar American art form, the quiz show. He's attended countless game shows, collecting and mounting the tickets as souvenirs of his rites of passage. Bob is a true believer of television, though it has affected his life in a rather unusual way. I tend to live. Uh, a game show existence of sorts. I'm known in my dormitory as TV Bob, and uh, I can usually come up within a couple of seconds with some type of game show reference for just about anything. I carry a little uh, portable bell with me uh, in, in certain situations, and uh, when someone says something that's uh, intelligent or bright, I'll give them a ding on the bell, I'll say, right answer. Or when someone says something rather dumb, I'll go, ooh, no, I'm sorry. That's incorrect. Try again. Something like that. I've been watching TV since I was mm, yay high. I call myself the world's first boob tube baby. And uh, when I was six, my parents took me to a TV taping in the Ed Sullivan Theater in New York, and the show was Password. And I was so awed by the whole lights and cameras in action, so to speak. And, and uh, since then, I've been hooked. I, I go to TV shows all the time. I, I work in television. And I've made my, my room uh, a museum to television as best I can. OK, Ray, with $120, you're the champion. And Don Pardo, what does he win? Well, you and a companion will fly luxurious Mexico to the airline most people fly to Mexico on your trip to Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> yes, you'll spend two luxurious weeks with the deluxe condominium suite at the Wasada Vallarta in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And when you return from Puerto Vallarta, you'll have a brand new car. <laughs> Yes, it's a 1981 Chevrolet Chevette with 18 new center features. Get an AM-rated white wall tires, front bucket seats, 1.6 liter engine, carpeting, and much more. Chevrolet Chevette, it'll drive you happy. And Back in the late 60s, Tom and Dick Smothers were regarded as the cutting edge of alternative network programming. 
and they paid the price by having their program censored and then canceled entirely. Looking back on those days, they recall the kinds of people who tried to dull that cutting edge. They dealt in words and not in ideas. And uh, when we did our first half hour sit sitcom, uh, we couldn't say a word like crazy, they said. You can't say crazy. I said, Tommy, you're crazy. We can't tell your brother's crazy because there might be crazy people out there watching, you know? <laughs> and they were serious. You can't offend these people. I mean, they have parents and they're writing letters. I mean, it was incredible. The problem was in the, the level of uh, the, uh, the network censors, the programmers, who hadn't been used to new ideas or new concepts or doing social commentary or these groups. Uh, so CBS called me, I guess it was about six or eight weeks ago, and they said, we want you to write a miniseries, $360,000. I will say that again slowly, $360,000. Now, I don't know, I can't picture in my mind $360,000. When I, when I think of it, all I can see in my mind is a big nickel, okay? <laughs> they called me and they said, we want you to do a miniseries, anything you want to write, anything you want to write. They wanted fantasy or science fiction, something like that. They said, all we require is that you do you use latest state-of-the-art? I said, what? They said, use latest state-of-the-art. I said, well, I use a typewriter. Uh, you know, papyrus and quills are so hard to come by. They said, no, no. Uh, we, and I, you know, after I got through this, this uh, semantic jungle, I found that what they were talking about was special effects that they had all kinds of crazed special effects, you know, uh, laser blasts and, and uh, robots and uh, a lot of uh, uh, metal things. And they wanted me to put a lot of things that made booms in space, the vacuum of space, where there is no sound. And as long as I would do that, they didn't give a damn. They didn't give a French fry in hell what the story was about. I mean, I could have had talking mice. They didn't care. And I said, you know, put it in your ear and get out of my face. Just get back in the wind and leave me alone. The name of the game in television is How Do I Win 8 O'Clock Tuesday Night? That's all. And, and that translates, of course, to profits. How do I deliver to the stockholders a better profit statement this year than last? But that's the name of the game for every industry in America right now, solely for, for each executive officer of each uh, 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 major corporation in America. The name of the game is how does this quarter beat uh, the profit statement of the last quarter? So long as that's the name of the game, satisfying a public uh, helping to ennoble, to use your word, to ennoble and, and uh, 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 inform and to uh, help with the future is not in anybody's mind. There were moments on television constantly, and there still are. Uh, there's a show called Hill Street Blues that is on right now, and I think it's about as, uh, as high up the mountain as you're ever going to get in television. It's an astonishing piece of work, intelligently done and uh, uh, brilliantly directed and very creatively done. I'm sad to say I haven't seen my friend Grant Tinker's Hill Street Blues, uh, but everything I hear about it and read about it, and my closest friends who have watched it, I'm not an inveterate television uh, uh, watcher. After spending all of those years working six nights a week taping and, and rehearsing the seventh, eighth, and ninth nights, uh, I mean, I've just, I'm not in the television habit. I see something when I, when I hear about it and, and I throw a cassette on it. Uh, but Hill Street Blues, I'm, I, I would have to believe is wonderful from everything I've heard about. I wish I could say I saw it. When quality does emerge on television, the phrase, too good for TV, is often heard. One recent network offering that seems to deserve that phrase is Hill Street Blues, a program that, despite wide critical acclaim and a growing cult audience, may well turn out to be yet another example of television that somehow failed to connect with the mass audience. The networks, I think, tend to underestimate the, the intelligence of their audience. And, and they have a tendency uh, uh, of gravitating towards some of the most meretricious of, of, of concepts and stories, the kinds of things that are more promotable than make intrinsically good stories, good honest stories. Their need is not, per se, to make a good show, nor is it to make a bad show. I mean, I don't think that that's really an issue with them. Uh, their need is for a successful show. And what may or may not constitute a successful television series uh, has frequently has very, very little to do with its, its quality level. 
fundamentally they have to a lot of very ambitious young guys are constantly looking for a way to justify their positions and what they do they're looking for self-aggrandizement I think um, I think it's, it's just a function of being young and very ambitious and I think if more networks more time was given to people doing their own thing I think you would really be surprised at the quality of stuff that this town could put out. Television is in a state of expansion. For better or for worse, the medium is now being blasted by a new wave of technological innovation. Every day, millions of video signals are transmitted through vast electronic networks, linking superstations, satellites, and cable systems, and offering a variety of different channels to American viewers. Those same viewers are now accessing the new technologies and using two-way cable, interactive games, personal computers, or home recorders in what may be the beginning of the video revolution. You're going to be using your television set to retrieve an awful lot of information. You're going to be, uh, uh, be having access to libraries and, and other data banks. You're going to be able to pay your bills out of your groceries. You're going to be able to do uh, all many of the transactions that require movement now in, 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 in face to face contact. You're going to be able to do electronically by using your screen and just a, a keyboard to be able to punch in the keywords. So you're going to, it's going to be an electronic age. The TV set of the near future will be just one point part of a modular component system, much like a stereo system, with plug-in options such as video cassette recorders and video disc players. Press a button and the screen becomes a video game board, or a home computer, or even answers the telephone. Hello? Who's this, please? Hubie Brown. Congratulations, Hubie Brown. You've just won a free world cruise. I want Every day, more and more films and television programs are released on video discs and cassettes, available almost like books from specialty stores and video clubs. Consumers are already subscribing to video magazines, such as Video Fashion Quarterly or Instant Replay. Cable News Network Atlanta, Ted Turner's new operation. Instant Replay is going to take you there, talk to the people who make it work, find out how the state-of-the-art equipment they're using enables real video journalism to take place. Today, about 20 million homes have cable TV, and that number is expected to double by 1984. The combination of cable, satellite, subscription, or pay TV is turning the home screen into an information terminal, offering a variety of specialized channels to the consumer. Movies, news, sports, arts channels, as well as children's, ethnic, religious programming, and shop-at-home services, all in addition to the already existing broadcasting fair. So the police department's going to get a channel, and the fire department's going to get a channel, and the PTA is going to get a channel. And that means all of us are going to have to learn to deal with and learn how to make media better because it's going to be a more important part of our life. One possible vision of the video future is interactive. The viewers are in control, flipping, pinging, or zapping their way through a video game, or talking back to their TV via two-way cable, such as Cube, a multi-channel cable system allowing for interaction between viewer and programmer in such areas as local politics, education, and security. One of the things that attracts me very much about the new, the new video media is that it breaks it down to a much more personal kind of experience. You can be on either side of the camera. Thanks to the development of cheap and simple home video cameras, every TV viewer can now become a TV maker. Think of the local cable channel as CB Radio with Pictures, a bustling outlet for those who feel they have something to say on television. Others will find home video of a far more personal use as family entertainment or as a means of self-expression. What we're really doing right now is we're learning the language and the syntax of expression, okay? You're learning it. I'm learning it. Everybody's learning it. I'm convinced that there is an archetypal visual language of images and symbols 
that is relative to every human being on the face of the earth. Does your television set just sit there, turned off when your favorite programs are not on the air? If you act now and take advantage of this amazing offer, you'll be able to put your TV set to a thousand and one uses. The Swiss Army Tube is now available in this country. That's right, those clever Swiss soldiers worked very hard between wars to figure out how to get the most use out of their TV sets. The Swiss Army Tube comes complete with electric fan, iron, clock, oxidizer, blender, grinder, hair dryer, vacuum cleaner, electric can opener, electric knife, electric fork, waffle iron, electric racer, toaster, popcorn popper, vibrator, and toothpick. It cooks, it sucks, it blows, it slices and dices, and much, much more. If you act now, you can get your Swiss Army Tube for only four ninety nine ninety nine. That's four ninety nine. 99 in Swiss francs. Sorry, American dollars not accepted. Send gold in Swiss francs to Swiss Army Tube, Fabco 1984, Escrow, California. That's in escrow. No matter what lies ahead in television's future, most observers feel that the audience will still be the most important factor dictating the changes in the medium. Still, Harlan Ellison feels that the potential of television has been debased and trivialized by its creators. But why should they feel any more guilty than the people who sit at home and take it and slop it up? It's, it's a nation of slaves, slaves to television, and when slaves don't want to revolt, why should the masters care?